Good afternoon. Welcome to our Patient Family Town Hall. Today, we're going to talk about central line associated bloodstream infections. I'm Dr. Ann Riley. I'm the medical, Cent medical director of the Cancer Center here at CHOP. I'm here today with Emily Stiglitz. Emily is a registered nurse in both our inpatient and outpatient settings here at CHOP for over eight years, and she's now a safety quality specialist in outpatient oncology. And today we're going to talk to you about central lines and central line infections. So today we're going to do um, a little bit of an update here, and then uh, our presentation is about 30 minutes, and then that will leave us about 15 minutes time for questions and answers. And if you have any questions or comments as we're doing the talk, please pop them into the Q&A. We, uh, we will be monitoring the Q&A, and so we'll be able to answer your questions in real time. Hopefully, by the end of this session, you will understand a little more about central lines or central venous catheters, infections in those central lines, and why they can be a problem for patients' allergy. And we'll learn a little bit more about what patients and family and cancer center staff can do to help prevent some of those central line infections. So our goals for today, there's a lot on the plate here for everybody. <laughs> We're gonna describe what a central line is and review some different types of central lines. We're gonna talk about why we place them, why they're good for kids in oncology, what some of the possible complications could be, explain what a CLABSI or a central line associated bloodstream infection is. We love an acronym, so you're gonna hear us say CLABSI a lot, and why it's really important to treat CLABSI. And then we're gonna share what we think you as patients and families need to know about your central lines and about central line infections, how to help manage your central line, what we do here at CHOP to help prevent infections in your central line or CLABSI, and what patients and families can do to help prevent the CLABSI. So I'm gonna show some diagrams and talk to you about the different kinds of central lines. There are basically, I'm gonna show you three different types and just, it, there's a little diagram of a child there. The first kind we're gonna talk about is what we, you'll hear us say PICC line, peripherally inserted central catheter. And this is a line that gets placed, as you can see on the boy, in a vein near the elbow. And then the line gets sent up through the vein into a big blood vessel near the heart. Uh, the, it comes out looking just like an IV, but ends up in that much larger vein. And then that blood flows from that vein into the heart and then out to the rest of the heart. The second line that we're gonna to talk to you about is more common, and you'll hear us call it a brobiac. This can also be called a tunneled catheter. And you can see on the, the diagram of the boy, those catheters go are placed um, under the skin on the anterior chest wall, so right in the middle of the chest. And then they're tunneled under the skin till they get to that big vein in the chest, and then they're put into that vein. This means that the catheter doesn't move. Uh, it has a little, comes out like an IV, but on the chest wall. Uh, and it's a permanent line that can stay in there for uh, months, up to a year or longer. And then the third type of central line that you'll hear us talk about is called a port or a porticath. A port is um, it's a little round piece of metal with a silicone top that's attached to a big IV. And that IV is put under the skin on the front of the chest. And then again, tunneled under the skin until it gets to that big vein in, inside the chest. There is skin over the port, but if you stick a needle through that skin into the silicone top, you can access the bloodstream in that way. And so the port is a little bit different because it lies under the skin. It doesn't have what we call an exit site. It doesn't exit out of the skin. And when we're not using it, it's under the skin completely. If people have questions about those, you should definitely ask us because that's a complicated, <laughs> those are complicated to lines. So uh, why do we have central lines? Why do we place a central line in a child? Well, they can be used for a lot of things. If you saw, we tunnel them into that big vein in the chest. There's lots of blood there. It's very easy to draw blood work. Very easy to put medicines in there, chemotherapy particularly in our children, and blood products can go in there. We can use that big vein to provide IV nutrition to patients who can't eat or tolerate tube feedings. We have a very complicated algorithm or choice thing uh, in the hospital that helps us decide which of the three major types of central lines is best for a child. Um, and it's really based on how much blood work they're going to need, what kinds of medicines they're going to need, um, how long the line is going to need to be there, 
and your doctors and nurses can talk with you about your child and why a particular line is chosen for, for your particular child. Another reason that we have a central venous catheter, some of the agents, the medicines that we use are really irritating to blood vessels and to tissues. They're what we call vesicants. And um, if you use a central line to administer a vesicant, the central line dilutes that medicine much more quickly and it doesn't irritate the vein. If you try to put one of these irritating medicines into an IV or a small vein, it can really irritate the vein. It can also irritate the tissue around it. And if you use I IVs for a long, long period of time with those kinds of irritating medicines, you can really lead to scarring or permanent irritation of those smaller veins, and we don't like to do that if we don't have to. We like to have central line in children who are going to need lots and lots of blood work. Blood work can be taken from a central line instead of by a needle stick, and it helps avoid those repeated blood sticks that can be very, very traumatic for children. You know, for our patients, using a central line can be a big relief for somebody who's really bothered by blood draws or by IV placements. And let's be frank, who is not bothered by blood draws and IV placements? So we really think that for many children, particularly small children, it's really a benefit to just take that anxiety away and, and have the blood be able to draw be drawn from a central line instead of from a stick. So we think central lines are great for your child, for medicines, for you know, avoiding some of the trauma of IVs and blood work. Uh, for being a really convenient way to give all of the medicines and blood products that your child needs while they're going through therapy. Well, why are we even talking about them? Well, there are some risks associated with having a central venous catheter or a central line, and we want to talk about those as well. You know, central lines are a medical device. As you saw from those diagrams, they go into the body and they stay there. So they can become actually infected. Uh, and if you think about anything in your body that doesn't belong there can become infected. And when we think about infections for those catheters or central lines that are entering the body, we think about infections either at the skin site or inside the body. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. There are also possible complications to a central line. So central lines can break or crack, particularly we know that while we're sure your children are wonderful, they are sometimes pulling on the line. We've seen kids using their lines like a, you know, like a lasso. They flip it over their shoulder. They pull it. They're playing a game. So, you know, lines are they're pretty stretchy and they're pretty strong, but they can break or crack, particularly when they're very old. Uh, they can be affected by things that clot them off to make it hard to draw blood and push things through. Um, and they can clog off with hardened medications. So the other problem with central lines is that they have to be placed and removed under anesthesia or deep sedation, and that's not nothing. We don't want to anesthetize or sedate your child for no reason. So we think very carefully about which children need a central line and which children maybe could do without one. So this is like an overwhelming slide. We geek out in medicine sometimes and make you a chart, but it talks about those complications that can happen to your line and some of the things that we do for them. So if you, we worry about a blood clot, the medical name for that is a thrombus, but we, you'll notice that we flush our catheters with heparin, which is a blood thinner, every time we use them or every time we close the line to prevent that from happening. And then if it does happen anyway, we can use blood thinners or heparin or other kinds of blood thinners to bust up those clots and make the clots smaller. If we have skin complications, if the skin gets irritated or infected right where the line goes into the skin, um, we, we can try to prevent that by keeping the skin there very clean and dry. And sometimes if it does get irritated, we can put ointments or local um, care. Uh, we have some medicines that we can use at the site of the line to make it feel better. And sometimes if it's really irritating, we take the line out and we try to make a better choice for your child. Again, the lines can leak or break. We do try to ask the children not to stress the catheter. Let's not chew or bend, or but, but we know that sometimes they do. And we actually can repair those lines. We have people in the hospital called vascular access specialists or line specialists, and those people can actually repair the cracks in the line. They have materials that they can take that silicone and repair the crack or, you know, um, re, uh, they take little pieces and put them back in and fix them. They're amazing. I don't even know how they do it, but they're great. So we can fix those things as well. And then sometimes if a catheter is clogged with hardened medicines, we have medicines, other clot busters that we can put through. So there are some complications and things that we think about behind the scenes that we can 
do a lot of things about and fix. We don't want you to really worry about them, but you, you do know that we're watching out for them and we have things to do that we can fix those complications. The thing we're here to talk about today is the CLABSI, or Central Line Associated Bloodstream Infection. We love an acronym. You'll hear us say CLABSI all the time because it takes way too long to say Central Line Associated Bloodstream Infection. And this is something we really worry about because we spend a lot of time in oncology trying to prevent your child from getting an infection. And we all know that children receiving therapy for cancer, like chemotherapy, are more likely to get infections in general. We're all very, very careful with your children to keep them isolated and clean and infection free. So when you have a medical device that's in your body, it can always become infected. The definition of a CLABSI is an infection of the bloodstream that happens in a person who has a central venous catheter. If you have a bloodstream infection and you have one of these catheters, we kind of have to assume that the catheter was part of the problem and that the infection entered in some way because the catheter was there. And so we work very, very hard to try and prevent this. And we think that most, if not all, of these infections are preventable if we can always do the right thing. We think that CLABSIs occur in one of two ways. The first is, and this makes sense, you have this line going through the skin. And we think sometimes that germs from the skin or bacteria can get onto the catheter and cross into the bloodstream coming in from along the line from the skin. And then the second thing is, sometimes in a child, who is uh, immunocompromised, their immune system isn't working right because of cancer therapy or other things, the germs or bacteria from other areas of the body get into the bloodstream, are carried by the blood to the central venous catheter and then infect the catheter. So you can either infect the catheter directly or you can have bacteria in your system that then get to the catheter and infect it. And we think those are the two major ways that bloodstream infections in the context and you know, in patients who have a central line can happen. So as we talk about in um, new diagnosis teaching and nursing, hopefully is educating all the time, fever is often one of the first signs of an infection. And sometimes it's the only way in an immunocompromised child that we may know that the patient's having signs of an infection. So as we say often, please contact your healthcare provider in a timely manner uh, or as soon as possible when they have a fever. When you come to the hospital, if you go to an outside hospital, if you come here to oncology clinic, uh, there are a few things that you can expect will happen when you come with a fever. First thing is we wanna get blood culture. So we wanna know what's going on inside that high risk device. Um, so we'll draw blood cultures. Uh, we give antibiotics. Our goal when you're seen here with a fever is, or inpatient in the hospital is we wanna give antibiotics within 60 minutes. So as soon as we're able to, we wanna get the patient started on antibiotics. And then we'll keep you on antibiotics until those blood cultures result. They result uh, as quickly sometimes if there's an infection in six hours or as late as 48 hours. And so we'll keep a close eye on what's going on uh, with the patient, how they're looking, and then we'll give antibiotics until we kind of determine next steps based on what the patient's showing us. So Antibiotics are the main treatment for CLABSI. If you have an infected catheter or an infected bloodstream with a catheter there, we use antibiotics. Some infections are actually really hard to treat, even if you give antibiotics to a patient, because the germs or the bacteria can stick to the catheter. And in those patients, sometimes we actually need to remove the central line to remove the source of the infection so that it's eliminated and then the antibiotics can clean up whatever infection is left and get the child better. Some infections also don't go away as quickly as we would like. And so in those patients, the catheters also need to be It's very unusual for us to have to remove a catheter for an infection, but it does happen probably somewhere around 10% of the time we have to remove. One in 10 children will need their catheters removed because they've had an infection. In them. So you might ask, well, why don't you just give my child antibiotics all the time? And that way they have a central line and they won't get infected. It's a great idea, and we would love to try that, but <laughs> there are so many different microorganisms or bacteria, germs, fungus, all kinds of things that can infect a catheter. There's really no one antibiotic that we could give your child that would prevent all of those things. And, and you've heard about this with antibiotics before, if we give your child an antibiotic to prevent central line infections, they're very likely then to get an infection to a bug that just 
has learned to be resistant to that antibiotic. And so we know that we can't prevent all infections with antibiotics. Now, I will say that we may use antibiotics in some children as a preventative measure in some situations. So for example, children who have had fever with low neutrophil counts, obviously we're gonna give those children antibiotics until their neutrophil counts recover. Uh, children with certain specific, there are certain specific infections that if your child has had it before, we try to prevent it happening again. Um, and so there are a couple of infections that we know are likely to recur in children to happen over and over again. And if your child has had one of those infections, we will likely give the correct antibiotics for that in um, subsequent uh, periods of chemotherapy. And then there are some times that we can put antibiotics into the central line, flush it into the central line and just leave it sitting there. Sometimes we use alcohol for that because it's an antiseptic or an antibiotic leave it in the line and just let it sit there to sort of disinfect the line while it's there. And that's another way of trying to prevent infection with antibiotics. So an essential part of crab seed prevention um, is hand hygiene. It's as Dr. Riley was saying, clean hands uh, and, and skin bugs can get into the central line. So clean hands is one of the most important things. We talk with staff about this all the time. Hopefully you see them washing their hands, hand sanitizer, um, and then we ask that of families as well, because often many of you may be caring for the lines when you go home. And so there are times that we want soap and water. This is times that your hands are visibly soiled. If you uh, recently came in contact with stool or vomit, if you're uh, going to eat, if you just changed a diaper and now you're gonna do central line care, or for the staff here after handling hazardous drugs. Uh, and then all of the other times, Hand, alcohol hand rub is perfectly fine. So that hand sanitizer you're using, uh, that's just as good to get that good scrub before we're doing central line care. Sometimes actually there's some evidence that alcohol hand rub is better than soap and water because you actually get it more around your hands and you tend to rub better and longer and it's more antiseptic than soap and water. So we actually prefer the alcohol rub yeah. unless your hands are actually really dirty. <laughs> So when we talk about preventing these infections, we talk about keeping the catheter clean, keeping the environment around the catheter, keeping the skin clean to reduce the amounts of germs on the skin. We talk about making sure the catheter is really flushed well and often so that there are no clogs or clots. We talk about using antibiotics uh, that the health team prescribes in some situations to either prevent infections, for example, during fevers or during long periods of low white count. So we really are thinking all the time about ways to try and prevent infections. So some things that we do here at CHOP, um, some of these are equipment or supplies. So you may see dual, dual caps or a bow guard, which is a um, a cover that we can put over the connection sites to help minimize the risk of contamination. We have a CLABSI bundle, which I'll show you on the next slide, which is a bundle that we've put together of evidence-based um, guidance for staff here caring for the line so that we make sure any staff member who's doing the care has the same guidance and is caring for the line the same. On the inpatient side, um, we've recently implemented a vascular access team uh, partnership with the uh, staff on the inpatient side that are rounding on patients every single day that have central lines to make sure that we're actively looking at the line and minimizing any risk for an infection. And then as Dr. Riley said, we also have these prevention me methods. So if we know your son or daughter has a history of a central line infection, we can talk about an ethanol lock if it makes sense for uh, the child at the time, and then also the prophylactic antibiotics we talked about. And I realize we're using lots of medical words here because we know you're gonna hear those words when you're here in the hospital. So bundle is like, an, a, it's a real chop <laughs> term here where it means you know a bunch of different things that we do that we've put in a little bundle and we tell everybody, these are the things you do, these are the things you do. It's a very um, that is a a medical word. chop word. <laughs> this is our example of our bundle. Um, and so, as Dr. Riley said, it's just, you know, six things that when we put them all together, we think all of these things will really minimize the risk of uh, a central line infection in the patient. So these are things you should be seeing all the time or on the back end, again, just really for the staff to know. So we're always performing this, the same care for every patient. This is a complicated slide. 
but it talks about the, we don't expect you to read all of this, but it's the <laughs> basic, you'll see this actually posted in our clinic and on our inpatient unit. And so we think it's important for families to see exactly what we're doing. Yeah. So hand hygiene, washing your hands, the most important thing. Yeah. Uh, dressing integrity. So what that means is we look at what you're addressing. Is it is it complete? Is it peeling off? Is yeah. it dirty? Is it far enough from the insertion site? So it's really protecting that skin uh, to reduce the risk of an infection. Uh, bathing and hygiene, obviously, more ways of keeping people clean. Yeah. Um, Standard access, so scrubbing that hub. Hopefully you hear the squeak and you see the nurses doing that, the 15 second scrub, 15 second dry. That's to make sure that any place that we're accessing the line is super, super clean. We don't want any bacteria getting in there. Yeah. And you'll notice, obviously, we're all wearing masks, so we don't breathe on the line while we're accessing it, and we don't want any bacteria to get there while we're playing with the line. Yeah, and then standard line changes, so making sure we're changing the tubing, and again, this is based on evidence, um, so knowing that we're changing the tubing and the caps at a certain regimen on the inpatient side, at a different regimen on the outpatient side, um, and that we're tracking that as a team, so that's being documented in EPIC. And then that we're talking as a team about the line. So we'll get to this in a little bit, but one of our goals is also, as much as we get the line in for all of these helpful reasons, that we're all actively talking about if the line's no longer needed, how do we get it out? So again, some things your healthcare team will do. Um, we talked about clean hands, it's so important. The hub scrubs, and we really encourage and are okay if there are times that you see this and you're worried about that 15 second scrub or dry, please talk with the, the nurse, the provider, whoever's doing that care. We support that and we want everyone to feel safe with the care we're performing. We are not expecting you, however, to no. time us. You're welcome to time us, <laughs> yes. but it's not your job. Nope. All of us, we're either watching the clock yeah. or some of us actually have a song that we sing inside <laughs> our heads that we know is 15 seconds long, but yeah. we have different ways of making sure that we really do spend that full amount of time drying your child's hub. Totally. Um, and then uh, that we're cleaning the skin. So when there's a dressing change or a port access, we're cleaning that skin with the right agent for the patient, depending on if they have any allergies. Um, as Dr. Riley said, we're all wearing masks when we're going to do any of that access. It's easier right now with COVID, but uh, we'll, we'll continue to do that if masking goes away. And then, yeah, <laughs> on the inpatient side, we're doing those daily CHG treatments. We're changing our linens, we're changing our clothing, and we're doing oral care. Yeah, the, the, we haven't talked a lot about the CHG. Mm -hmm. um, I think, here we go. There we go. <laughs> so the CHG treatment is um, the a, a red bottle now, it's a pump, and so we're asking that we're doing the CHG treatment within 24 hours of the last CHG treatment, so at least every day on the inpatient side. Certainly, if um, the child prefers to bathe their shower, we do that as well. So we don't want to minimize that for your family. CHG is a antiseptic um, that's in sort of a sticky, for those of you who have had to use it, <laughs> it's, it's a sticky substance that really sticks to the skin. And so we take this antiseptic and we wipe it all over your child to kill the bacteria on the skin so that the skin is really clean. And it is unpleasant because it's sticky, but that helps it stay for the 24 hours and keep working to reduce the amount of bacteria on the skin while the central venous catheter is in place or while it's accessed and open yeah. at the hospital. Yeah. And then we're changing our clothing every day and we're washing our linens every day, again, while we're in the hospital. That's because um, patients and families in the hospital are getting a lot of medical treatment and so, we're not saying you need to do these things at home at such a strict regimen because the really the higher risk time period is when the child's in the hospital. When you're home, you're in your natural environment. Uh, we're saying that the patient counts are well enough to be home, so that's yeah. why it's different. Well, and if you think about in the hospital, yeah. your child spends all day in that bed, yeah. every day, and there's all kinds of other people coming in, touching yeah. the covers, seeing your child. It's just a, it's a little, not like your bedroom at home. Yeah. So we wanna make sure it's super clean. Uh, and while you're in the hospital. And then mouth care is the other piece of this. So we talked about bathing and then toothbrushing. Um, you know, it's just as important in home and now that we're bringing you in and um, 
So we do mouth care at least once a day. It is recommended twice a day for the tooth brushing. And then we do a, a mouth care treatment as well, uh, which is that CHG mouth rinse um, for patients who are able to tolerate that. Uh, in younger patients, babies, we even say about rinsing with the swab, and it could be just with water or breast milk even with babies, um, just to get anything that's sitting in the mouth, we want to get that out or moving. And the reason we do this is that there is a lot of research that's been done. Remember when we talked about um, bacteria coming from the body and going to the line, we know that one of the dirtiest places in your in your body is your mouth and your whole you know, gastrointestinal tract. So from the mouth to the stomach to the bowel and out, there's a lot of bacteria and bugs in that area. And there is some research evidence that tells us that if we can keep the mouth clean and reduce the amount of bacteria in the mouth, that that actually reduces the amount of bacteria that can get into a bloodstream and reduces the chance of getting a bad infection when you're in the hospital. And then, um, like we talked about, let's work together to keep your room uncluttered. It's a, it's a different environment, um, but that way we can clean it every day. And that, again, helps reduce uh, the environmental ways that infection can get in. Oh, I, we have a question I'm going to answer right now. So Jen asks, how often do you recommend changing linens at home? It's a great question. Yeah, I would say certainly, um, I think our standard recommend, I mean, we're not going to tell you how to keep your house uh, <laughs> because I can't tell you that. Yeah, what we do at my house. But mm -hmm. I would say uh, weekly is yeah. probably fine because totally. your children are only spending, you know, eight, ten hours in the bed. And there's not a lot of medical work going on. There's not a lot of other people in the bed, you yeah. know, drawing blood and doing those kinds of things. So I think weekly, unless the child soils the bed, obviously, yeah. uh, should be fine for home. I apologize. I noticed a, a dash in this slide I forgot to take out. So I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, but just back to some things that we can continue to do to protect the central line as well. So we're going to ask that we minimize and possibly avoid in general um, any tubing dragging on the ground. So if you're doing laps while you're on the inpatient unit or out here in the outpatient setting, how do we hold that or secure that tubing so it's not dragging on the ground? Um, as we discussed earlier, we're going to minimize or reduce pulling at the central line and really hoping that we're not, or we're redirecting children to not be playing or chewing with the line. Our hands aren't always clean, and so if we're touching it, it increased that. Um, your nurse will work with you to redirect the line. So if the line is hanging near a diaper, G-tube, ostomy, how do we redirect that line to another area so that we uh, reduce the risk of contamination? Um, we ask that you don't disconnect IV tubing or perform any care unless you're educated to do that and uh, are doing that at the guidance of the medical team. And then if you notice that the dressing is peeling up, call your nurse on the inpatient side or at home, call your home care nurse or if you need a clinic. Uh, we really, it's important that that dressing's intact. And so if you notice it peeling up, we're able to change that for you. Um, we do say no swimming, unfortunately, if you have a Broviac or a pick line. Uh, it's a little too risky. We can help you safely shower, certainly, and the nurse or the medical team can provide devices for that, but swimming could be tough. Yeah, so we have a question here from Mia, and it says, can kids swim in a pool, a lake, or an ocean with a line in place? Yeah. And so as, as Emily says, the lines that exit out of your skin, we really are afraid to have you jump into an open body of water with that because the water can get up along the catheter and we do worry that it can infect the bloodstream through that catheter. If you have a port and the port isn't accessed and the skin is intact, you know, there's no cuts or anything and the skin is over the port, then you can actually swim with that. That is when we're deciding what line your child is going to get, that's an important piece yeah. of uh, whether we're going to put in a Broviac or a port is, um, has to do with how much water the yeah. child will want to be around it. But yeah, unfortunately with a Broviac or a PICC line, we do ask that you not go all the way underwater. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we covered all those things. We just talked about protecting the line as well from while you're bathing or showering. If you're struggling with that, please feel free to call the phone nurse here in the outpatient setting. Call your nurse at the bedside on the inpatient setting, and we can certainly help with that. We want to maintain that normalcy for you, so we can absolutely get you in a shower or bath. I think those are all the tips that we have. It's a lot of information all at once. I think what we're trying to show is that um, while we worry about CLABSI, and CLABSI can be 
you know, a bummer for your child because you spend time in the, we don't want your children to be sick or spend time in the hospital. If we all work together and everybody does their part, we really think we can prevent most infections and try to keep your children healthy and out of the hospital. So thank you for all of your time. We welcome any questions that people have. Uh, happy to answer them in the Q&A if anybody has anything uh, that they'd like to ask. And certainly, Ellie and I are always available uh, through the, the clinic phone numbers if you ever have questions about these. Emily's an expert in central lines and Clabsy, and she uh, can answer all of your questions. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thanks for your time.